Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, that's me, I'm Cristina, and it's true. So I've been in this industry for about seven years now, and I've always been a project manager, but I've always been interested in technology, machine translation, and all related. And when I joined EA a couple of years ago, they were doing a lot of research about this, and so I was really happy to join them. And actually, I started to get more and more interested, and that became my focus really naturally. So I don't have really any kind of technical backgrounds and nothing that is like engineering related, no machine learning experience before. I'm just a localization expert, actually. But I will show you actually what we have done so far only knowing what I know and um, how we managed to implement machine translation in our workflow and uh, yeah so I will actually talk about how is the workflow now and um, which are the challenges that we have to face daily we will talk a little bit about machine translation and why we decided to start looking into that and start to look into how to implement that and uh, which provider we chose, how we build models and so on, and actually how will be the new workflow starting very, very soon. So, at EA we do games, and um, we have um, two offices for localization, but only one for translation, which is the one where I am, in Cologne. So, as you can imagine, we have offices all around the world, and all translations <clears throat> are actually going through Cologne office. But we have to deal with all different kinds of time zones and uh, we have to make sure that translations are delivered even in the weekends, also outside of our working hours. So we had to um, come up with different systems to make sure that this happens. And um, this is a workflow that we have at the moment. It's very small, I hope you can read, but let's go through it. So um, the requesters um, ask for translation, either use our TMS or using different tools connected to it. So all translation requests are gathered into one tool and they get to us. We uh, apply, of course, translation memories and term base to make sure that everything is consistent because, of course, as you can imagine, especially for gaming, terminology is really important and we need to make sure that name conventions are respected, but also uh, third-party terminologies are respected because if it's not happening, then, of course, our game cannot be shipped. Um, so the job goes through the M and TB, and um, when, the, when we get the job, we already see 100% matches, fuzzy matches, and so on. Uh, before sending it out, because we don't have any in-house translators, but we only work with vendors, before sending it out, the project manager, which in our team are called MLS, Multilingual Localization Specialist, they check the job, they check if everything is fine, they check if the matches are actually matches, and then they send it out for translation. The, um, the task um, reaches the, the vendor, they perform their job, they do all the QA checks needed and everything, and they send it back. They send it back, the MLS, they check again if everything is fine, if, the, um, if grammar is fine, if everything is correct with another QA check, and then the job is closed and the requester will get it back. We have another system in place because, as I said before, when we are not there during the weekend outside of our working hours, um, we still receive requests, and so if they can wait, then they will, they will be processed the day after. If they cannot wait, then we have this system in place, which we call on-demand. So the requester would simply need to select the, that service. The, the process is the following. So um, the files are sent directly to the vendors. The vendors work on them. They upload them with a specific name in a specific folder. And by doing that, they will close automatically and they will be delivered to the requester. As you can imagine, there is a lot of manual work involved, so a lot of errors can happen. If the vendors don't call the file with the exact same name, the file won't be processed and the request won't be closed, and there is no one there to actually check. The requester wouldn't know who to contact in this case, and that's a big issue for us. So that's why that's one of the reasons why we also started to think that maybe machine translation would be an idea, because even if it's not perfect, at least they would get something, and then the next day we would check what's happening. And that's why, that's what I was saying. So we chose machine translation, first of all, to increase the speed of our translation turnaround. 
than to save some costs and especially to have 100% visibility because in this case, for example, the requester would simply need to click a button, for instance, and then they would get the translation immediately. But of course, it's not raw machine translation and it's not um, using a not-trained model. So we use it in combination with translation memory and term base and of course we use a customized model and then I will show you a little bit more. Before implementing machine translation, there were some considerations that we have to make. So as I said before, we choose it to translate faster, we choose it to translate more, and we choose it to translate cheaper, assuming that the quality is good enough to allow post editors to actually save some time and perform a better job. But of course, post editing is required. We don't plan to publish anything which is only um, raw machine translated. It's not publishable as it is, and it's not for free. So it's not that we can simply process million of words without asking for any kind of money, but they still need, the requesters still need to take into consideration that this will have some costs. Um, at EA, we have chosen Microsoft at the moment um, for several different reasons. The first one is that it's been used throughout all EA functions. So everyone that is using NT is going to use Microsoft and is going to use the model that we create. In this way, we can, of course, provide a better quality model, but at the same time, we can get feedback and then we can use it to train the engine and make the quality better and better. We can build the language model on top of the existing one. We can integrate into our CAT tool by using an API and we can um, give this API to everyone else so everybody can use that. And it has a neural approach because that's better. The problem is that we don't have our customized, um, we don't have our um, model starting from scratch. So it's a big limitation because as you can imagine, we don't have really full visibility on how the basic model is built. Everything that we can do is building something on top of that. And so not knowing how is the model start that we start from, we don't know actually if some of the mistakes that we have in the target are coming from that model or are coming from the way that we train the model. And that's a limitation. There is no games category in uh, Microsoft at the moment. And so, of course, it's kind of basic. And sometimes some terms that have different meanings are a little bit hard to, to translate in the gaming terminology. And as I said before, there is no visibility on how the model works and it's an issue. At the moment, before, of course, in the future, we are already looking into the possibility of building our own model, and we are working on it a lot with our AI department and everyone, but at the moment, we still want to try it out, and we still want to implement it in most of our projects. So we want to work on it and make sure that we can do the most out of what we have. So at the moment, we can solve the situation by building a model on top of the existing one, we can um, optimize the text by um, modifying the way that it's imported into our CAD tool. And uh, of course, we rely a lot on our translation memories and term base to make sure that in case there are some terms that um, are a little bit problematic are picked up by our translation memory and uh, term based. The reason why we want to build a model is because, as I said before, we work with vendors. So um, ven vendors for us are very important. They're just not like random translators, but each of them has a specific um, project because some people are better like localizing football text, some other people are more creative and so they will be assigned on a Sims project and so on. So it's really important that we just don't like use the same kind of model and the same raw machine translation for every kind of project, but we build customized model for everything that we have to make sure that actually when the post editors will get the job, they won't have to um, struggle too much and they won't just decide to translate from scratch because the um, output is not good, but it's actually good enough and they will benefit from it because they will, they can, they will be able to actually translate faster thanks to the fact that quality is already good enough and some segments um, don't even need to be modified. Um, Yeah. Oh. I don't understand you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
language issue. <laughs> what happened? Oh, no power? Go. Ah, that's it. So yeah. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, uh, when building a model, actually, it's really important to make sure to do some steps before. Because even building a model doesn't need that we simply put all our translation memories on, in it, and that's it. But we need to make sure that all data is actually very clean and ready to be used. So we um, developed a tool to clean our translation memory, and um, we um, have different criteria that we select in this tool. And in this way, the tool will eliminate all the text that could create noise in the model. Like, for example, we remove all text with variables in it because it does, it, it's not needed. We remove all too short sentences, too long sentences, and so on. We uh, make sure to use exactly the specific translation memory and the glossary for that specific project for a specific engine to make sure that really the text is super tailored to the target text that we will have. And um, we don't use a lot of data, but we make sure that the data is actually good and well done. Um, as I was saying before, another um, way for us to make sure that the output quality is good enough to start from is optimizing the text when importing it into, um, into our tool. To do that, we, apart from analyzing the um, language structure, we um, extract all the variables from all our um, files, and each game has different variables, of course. We make a collection of those, and we create specific regular expressions to, to make sure that these uh, variables are actually turned into markups, and they are not translated by uh, the, the system. Because as you can see here, um, this is an example of how it looks when these variables are actually turned into markups. You're probably very familiar with it. And um, here there are some examples, and um, maybe some of you speak Italian, maybe not, so I will just go through it. The first example, you can see the variable is in the brackets and its value. In the first example, that variable was not converted into a markup. And so, unfortunately, MT mm, translated the, the word inside the parentheses, and that's totally wrong. Not only because it's wrong, but also because if that text then is used, that uh, is going to break the code, and then it's not going to be displayed at all. So, in the second sample, mm, you see that whenever it was turned into a markup, it's not translated anymore. And so, of course, it's better like that, especially because in this way, it's not visible to the posteritor as well. And so even the posteritor won't have the possibility of making mistake. Of course, you can see that because in case you want to see what that variable stands for, then you can simply go on it and then you will, it will be displayed. But it's not visible in the text. In the second example, you can see that in the first text, those um, variables were not turned into a markup. And so uh, the problem is that in the first here, so that's a verb, and that's uh, actually not translated into Italian, and that's totally wrong. It's not translated because there was no space between the variable and the verb, and so the empty thought that it would be just one, and so it didn't translate. And of course, that sentence doesn't make sense. First of all, because there is an English um, word in it, and second, because there is no verb in the sentence. So it's really um, visible that it's machine translated. In the second sentence, only by optimizing the text in that way, the, um, the verb is being detected and then is translated. And so uh, the sentence makes sense. And it actually doesn't really need to, to be post-edited because it's already working as it is. So um, what will change, actually, in, in the near future, that means next week, <laughs> <laughs> um, we will integrate machine translation in our workflow. So um, we want, um, it will be integrated in it. We won't need to actually tell the cut tool to do that, but it will do automatically. So what happens is that, where before, when the requester would send the translation, it would go through the TM and turn base, and that's it. In this case, it would be like this. It goes through the translation memory and the turn base first, 
and then everything that is not translated will go through the machine translation system and then the post editors will see of course all the matches all the 100% matches fuzzy matches and then empty the uh, project manager will always validate and see if everything is fine the job will go out to the vendors and they will perform post editing and not translation anymore the job they would perform of course the qa check the job would go back to the guys to check with another qa and then um, it would go back to the requester and uh, yeah we're very confident that it's going to work hopefully because <laughs> yeah we are planning to implement this um, for about 20 projects of ours and um, of course there will be some that will go better than others but in any case um, the quality that we got so far is good enough to um, to be sure that um, our post editors won't lose time by actually starting from scratch but they will have the chance to actually make the text better and um, work faster hopefully and that's the yeah it doesn't work but it's good. okay <laughs> thank you if you have any questions I'm happy to ask. So, do you have questions? Yes. We have a mic that will come to you. You have to take your mic. Oh, here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marina with Terra Translations. I'm wondering how you choose the content that you will use machine translation for. Because, as, as you know, well, <laughs> I don't have to tell you, but you know, a lot of the content is so creative and requires yeah. some transcreation in it. Yeah. So is it mostly going to be the marketing and website material or are you also using in-game text? So we're going to use in-game text as well, but not creative. So all the in-game text that we have selected are kind of, um, let's say, repetitive and uh, quite technical as well so yeah we are not going to implement it now for all those creative content like the sims for example it's not going to be part of a machine translation text we are going to implement it for sure for like customer support text because we got quite good result and yes for that so we um, the process was quite long to to select the all the projects and um, we made sure to run a lot of text not only on our side but also sending texts as tests to our vendors also to get their feedback because of course we it's not that we want to do this from one day to another but we want to make sure that they also agree on it and uh, that we can still work together yeah Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. Sorry if you if you told that and and, and I missed that because of my jet lag. Uh, so, uh, have you tried it on a number of language pairs? And did you how you perceive the quality is it similar for all language pairs you tried or different? Yeah, I know the quality is not similar. I mean, of course, for like the main languages, it's much better also because we have more data to train the engine and uh, there are some smaller languages for which is really not great. But at the same time, we don't have that much content to translate. So for those languages, it's more like a test. We just want to see how it goes. And um, for the main languages, we, um, we reached like really good quality. But the plan, that's why we actually want to start it now with a lot of languages because we start to with about like 30 languages and uh, even if of course now the quality is not at the same level, we want to start anyway because we want to get feedback, especially for those languages because the aim is that by the end of the year, at the latest actually, we want to be at the same level with all languages. And the only way to, to do that, in my opinion, is to get feedback from actually Real translation, so yeah. Thanks. Please identify yourself by name and company. Yes. Nice. Okay. Uh, my name is Wafa, and I work for uh, Saudi Soft. Um, games is actually very sensitive area, so I wonder where actually the real players' feedback. Um, is fit where it fits actually in your matrix i mean like you have uh, 
post editing feedback and uh, and machine translation feedback but the real players at the end are them yeah absolutely. they have their own <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah they have their own feedback because games is is different so if you are planning to measure that and where exactly in the workflow yeah. you are planning to measure it yeah so um, most of the um, projects that we will use machine translation on don't really um, get to the player in the sense of in game so it's mainly like articles and blog posts and stuff like that but of course like um, the idea is that we want to also implement an in game chat in which players can communicate and that's where we would get the feedback from the player unfortunately i mean it would be great to have feedback from the players but the reality is that they don't really read anything <laughs> So even with normal translations, let's say, we never get feedback. <laughs> Hi, Christina. Uh, Giri Olu from Content Quo. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the metrics. So if player feedback is out of question, so what kind of data are you guys going to collect on the quality of raw MT output, but also post-edited output, so if those are separate? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as you might know, we have an um, in-house team of vendor management, and they have came up, come up with different kind of matrices to check quality of translators and translations. Based on that, we have elaborated a kind of system to um, come up with something. Of course, it's very basic because also we don't know how to actually measure that, especially for some languages that we don't speak. At the same time, we have a huge um, LT department, so um, we rely a lot on our testers. We um, have come up with a simple, very simple uh, way of evaluating the text, so based on fluency and adequacy. And it's, it goes from one to four, one to four. So um, we just get in touch with our testers and then we ask them to simply evaluate that. And it's really hard for them as well because, of course, a lot of people are bi- have biased on machine translation. And so, of course, they will start saying that it's bad immediately. And yes. So. Oh, <laughs> Hi, Christina, Stefan from Altagram, video game localization as well. So, um, I have two questions. The one is a little broader and the one is, other one is more specific. First one, um, you said you're feeding your engines only project-specific data for each of your projects. Mm-hmm. So, what exactly is one project? Is it like one game-specific or is it just game genres? Or what are you using as boundaries for your projects? Yeah. For so, what you train an engine for? Maybe you ask, answer yeah. this one first. Yeah. yeah, so at the beginning we tried to see if it made more sense to actually have one general engine or like not game specific but genre specific. So sport, for example, RPG, for instance. And so, yeah. So for some of them, so we have different engines. We have a general one and then we have genre specific. So, for example, for sport games, we will most likely use the sport one for other stuff we will just use the general one and yeah okay thanks and the second question a little more technical maybe you were talking about these um value entities and stuff like that and markup that you make and put into tags with regex and like especially for values i mean um MT engines always struggle with context and it has no way of seeing what this specific tag is doing. For example, if it's a value, then it needs to be in the syntax of the sentence, right? But have you any experience with how you can make the engine recognize what it actually is and put it in the sentence in a useful way? No. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I thought so, but I hoped... No, we rely on the post editors for that. Yeah, I mean, this is the best. Actually, this is better than 
it was before when we started using it because when we started using MT and the variables were still there, they even got translated. So, yeah. Hi, thanks for your great presentation. Uh, just for my curiosity, uh, are you using MT for all gaming content, including your uh, test, like the game test? Uh, no, no. Uh, so if not, um, what, would, what, what is the workflow for your game test? The test? Yeah, yeah. well, at the moment we have like actual people testing it. So you're finding wonders to do the game test, right? Mm? Uh, so you're finding the winners to do the game testing? No, no, we have an in-house department. Ah. Yeah, so for testing, yeah, we have like really hundreds, hundreds of testers uh, in Madrid. And um, that's why we don't have in-house translators because we really rely on testing. The, the testing period is really, is very long. And uh, yeah, that's why we will actually have to train our testers as well about on machine translation and on what kind of text is actually um, produced by MT and by post editors because it's very different. At the moment they are used to test something that comes directly, directly from the translators, but then they will have to test something different. They will probably find a lot more mistakes and so on. So, so yeah. Thank you. Mm. Hi, Christina. Hi. It's Kwong from BFI. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, have you compared the result of the general baseline model and your custom model from mm -hmm. using your uh, TMs for training? And because I'm just wondering, because now, now the custom translator is, is charging us for the training course, and then it counts also the source and target characters. So, and you mentioned you will train the engines for for the projects. So, and with many languages. So I think the cost will rise up that very high. So. And I'm just wondering, is it really worth it to use a customized model or just you can just simply use the general model from, from Microsoft? Yeah, so we, we, of course, yeah, we did some tests and see because, yes, for some languages, for example, for the, um, let's say, minor languages, then that means the languages for which we don't have that much uh, content to translate. We also thought if it made sense to use a general one that was already there, and so maybe save some costs there, but actually no. I mean, even if uh, we don't have that much uh, training data for those languages, it still makes sense to train it and it still makes sense to invest in that training because the quality is really much better anyway. So even if the volume of translation is not that high, still makes sense. Uh -huh. Sorry. So, uh, do, do you plan to retrain the, the engines like uh, regularly? Or yeah. Just yeah. So, um, we will um, work on actually building a tool uh, for the continuous learning because we um, are planning to get a lot of feedback from hopefully from our vendors when we start. And so, we have to um, come up with a way to actually train the engine without having to do it all the time. So, we are working on that at the moment. Hello, this is Patricia Palladini from CA Technologies, a Broadcom company. Uh, I think you've done a great explanation on how to and you follow the right steps. My question is a little bit shift left. Are you controlling the source? Are you talking to developers on how they should write the text in the code so that you can make the most of, of the output, so you can make the most of the machine translation output afterwards? Yes, I mean, for some, Content creators, yes, we do that because we can do that, actually. So all the EA internal um, developers, let's say, that we can do that. And uh, we do that because it's fundamental. So, of course, we try to avoid to, to, to have two um, long sentences where the meaning is really not clear and we control the text. Of course, for some, we can't really do that because the text is very creative. But for those, actually, we don't need because we are not planning to... to um, it's for, Later. <laughs> <laughs> so you can catch Christina outside 
um, and I'm sure that she'll be happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Just want to move on to the next presenter because it's five. Is hey. Yeah.